I think it's so important for people to remember that they're the creators of their lives instead of the victim of their lives, mm -hmm. right? So the victim is saying, I'm feeling this way because that person or that circumstance or I don't have any money is causing me to feel this way. This is my relationship with money. What that really means is I'm using my lack to... I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis Howes. What is your, your thoughts around the identity of money and the psychology of how we yeah. how it plays in our lives because a lot of people want to make more they want to attract more but they're just struggling with just the concept of it mm -hmm. yeah well i think we've been programmed quite a bit uh in, with our relationship with money and we have a relationship with everything known in our environment you have a relationship a neurological network in your brain to for your parents for your cell phone for your computer where you live where you've lived in the past what you're going to do tomorrow that for the most part the brain is a reflection of everything that we know right so along with that is our relationship with money and mm -hmm. I, I feel like I have a really good relationship with money because I work on having a really good relationship with everything in my life right? Did you always have a good relationship with money I think so I think yeah. so I've never really lived in lack that just wasn't part of it even when I went to college and I had to take out student loans and stuff I always figured out a way to always be a little bit ahead of the curve and so so Let's back up and just look at how people uh, form beliefs because yes. most beliefs um, are created from past experiences, right? So uh, children, uh, when they're uh, in their early ages, their brain waves are very slow. Like their brain waves are in alpha uh, when they're like 7 to 12. They're in theta when they're like uh, 2 to 6 years old. And, and they're in delta like when they're when they're you know, newborn to two years old. And so these brainwave states uh, are states that were really suggestible to information. So when we hear information, we believe it. And we accept it, we believe it, we surrender to it as if it's the truth without analyzing it because there's no analytical facilities yet. Right. The, ana the analytical mind starts around 12 or so, seven to 12, and that analytical mind is actually what creates a barrier between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So, so before 12, roughly, what we see, how we model our parents' behavior, it's what they say to us. It's all being programmed subconsciously, right? And, wow. and so, so that's really, really important because if you heard money is the root of all evil, uh, money is bad, uh, only certain people are allowed to make money. You have to work hard to make money. Mm -hmm. This is how you got to do it. And that becomes the foundation subconsciously. Like, let's like right re recording an audio file you just keep recording that audio file it becomes a subconscious program mm -hmm. right so a lot of people have a relationship with money based on either what they've been told or what they've experienced in their outer environment right so so then we gain information from our environment and the stronger the emotion we feel from experiences in our lives the more altered we feel inside of us the more the brain freezes a frame and takes a picture and that snapshot is called the memory so based on an emotion based on an emotion the emotion alters our internal state so you're going along as Lewis feeling really good mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have this trauma you have this crisis you have this shock and all of a sudden you have this dramatic change in your internal state and your senses get heightened and then you freeze the frame and you associate this internal state with whatever it is that's causing it, right? And that's how we create long-term memories, right? So, are, are painful memories more uh, powerful or beautiful memories more powerful? Uh, they're both equal. Okay. Uh, they're both equal. But, but the problem is I think most people experience from more the negative yes. emotions, right? And those are negative emotions really are derived from the hormones of stress, right? So the alarm system, the emergency system creates an arousal uh, inwardly. And that arousal is saying there's something dangerous in your outer environment, right? And it could be a person, a circumstance, mm -hmm. a, an accident, or whatever. And that that change in emotional state causes you to remember the event. You got to pay attention, right? You got to stay really and narrow your focus on the cause. So, so think about people who have relationships with money, right? From the past, all beliefs. Are based on past experiences so you have an experience where you lose money you have an experience where uh, money's taken away from you. you have an experience where you don't have enough you're living in a place where there's not enough money or a family that's not enough money 
then the emotion that most people are living by on a moment-to-moment basis is lack. Like, I'm in lack of having something that I want, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because the experience changes your emotional state. You freeze the frame, you take a picture. The problem is, that's hardware. So we think neurologically within the circuits of that past experience and we feel chemically within the boundaries of that emotion, which would say, for example, be lack, right? So now the person says- Before you go on to the next thing, what happens to the body and the mind when it is in an environment of lack? Mentally or physically, I'm in lack. What is is the body and the mind saying? Yeah, so the body is saying, I'm waiting for some external event to occur. I win the lottery. Mm -hmm. I marry the right guy. Whatever it is, that you're waiting for that event to occur that experience produces an emotion. So the emotion then takes away the lack. And so when we play the game in three-dimensional reality, the creation game in three-dimensional reality, (laughs) um, we experience separation from everyone or everything because our our senses fool us into the illusion, the hallucination of separation. I'm here and you're there. Mm -hmm. I'm here and the door is over there. So I'm aware that I'm here at one point of consciousness and the door is over there, another point of consciousness. Okay, so in order for me to get from here to the door, I gotta move my body and do something through space. I gotta do something, and everything in this three-dimensional reality is gonna take time and energy, yes. right? So, yes. okay, so then here's, here's Lewis right here, mm-hmm. and then he says, okay, I want this experience in my future, and your brain automatically predicts and projects how far in the future you think it's gonna take. Maybe it's a year, five years, 10 years. 30 years. Oh my gosh. Right? Because that's what it's gonna take to pay off that house, right? So now, one point of consciousness, I'm here. The other point of consciousness is where I'm placing my dream. So I'm separate Mm. from that experience. So then how do I get to that experience? In three-dimensional reality, you gotta get up and you gotta do something. You gotta go to work, you gotta drive to work, it takes energy, you gotta fill your car with gas, you gotta eat food, you gotta work, you know, all this stuff. You gotta sleep, you gotta recover if there's stress. And now people are, in a sense, waiting for the experience that's 10 years down the road or 30 years down the road to happen to take away the lack of them not having it. And unfortunately, many times when the experience finally occurs, they can't enjoy it because mm-hmm. they're too exhausted, right? <laughs> right. So then, so you play the game, you, you, you go to school, you study really hard or you study on your own, you develop some skills, you make the right choices, you start saving money, you start learning from your mistakes, and then the game is how many things can you accumulate and that accumulation then you associate with being wealthy or being abundant or being successful, right? And some people get really good at it, right? Uh You can get really good at that. But for the most part though, when we create from three-dimensional reality, we're creating from lack and separation. In other words, you're driving down the road and you see someone driving a car that all of a sudden you realize that you don't have. The moment you become aware that that person has that car and you don't have it, you're in lack of having it, right? Mm -hmm. So what the brain naturally does is it naturally creates you driving that car. And you have an image of yourself driving that car and you start identifying, wow, that would be a greater experience for me to have. The problem is the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of actually happening it happening for most people is the concept called time, yeah. right? Between cause and effect, right? Uh-huh. So some people develop the ability to manage themselves and manage their life. They develop certain skills and they can pay for it and they can get it very quickly. The problem is when the novelty of that experience wears off, you know, the car, mm-hmm. and they're no longer identifying with that, and the, and the feeling of emptiness and lack comes back. They need to find something else. They gotta to go and find something else. And so there's this game that goes on where you never have enough, right? And that's the lack game, right? So then if you think about people uh, having the things they want in their life, when they create from lack and separation, it's the experience in three-dimensional reality that produces the emotion. And the emotion is saying, let's feel and experience this thing that you've been in lack and separation from. And that emotion then takes away the lack or separation. But you've worked really hard to get it. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Is there another way to do it? Yes. Okay, so the person who's living in lack is waiting for their wealth to feel abundant. 
They're waiting for their success to feel empowered. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for their healing to feel gratitude. They're waiting for their new relationship to feel love. They're waiting for their mystical experience to feel awe. That's the Newtonian model of reality of cause and effect. You know, waiting for that event to happen to take away this separation or lack. Nothing wrong with it. It's the way most people create. But what we've discovered is actually something else. The moment you feel gratitude, your healing begins. Mm. The moment you feel worthy and abundant, you're generating wealth. The moment you're empowered, you are moving towards your success. The moment you're in love with yourself and you're in love with life, you'll create an equal. The moment you are in awe of life, you're going to have a mystical experience. And so that's causing an effect, right? So then if you can teach people then how to create, instead of from lack or separation, but create from wholeness and create from what we call the quantum field instead of three-dimensional reality. What's the difference? Okay, so the way you, first of all, it takes knowledge, okay? The quantum field is an invisible field of energy that exists beyond our senses. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't hear it, you can't feel it. It exists beyond our experience of three-dimensional reality. Would this be in the our mind's consciousness or would this be in a different space? Okay, let's, let's, let's look at that. So the answer to the question is how much of your waking day do you put your attention on matter, mm -hmm. on the material world, and how much of your waking day are you aware of energy and frequency? For most people, they're unaware of the quantum field. And if you're unaware of it, it doesn't exist for you. Right. Just like you have a nose, but if you're unaware of it, it doesn't exist for you. The moment you become aware of it, it exists. Well, the quantum field, you can ask, you can study all kinds of science and they'll tell you there is this invisible field of frequency and energy that exists beyond the senses that tend to connect everything physical and material. In fact, everything physical and material is connected to this field, okay? So how do you get there, right? How do you get there? How do you get there? How do you get there? <laughs> so we discovered that when you take all of your attention off your body, and you are not paying attention to your emotions, your drives, your habits, if you could take all of your attention off of every element in your environment, your cell phone, your tablet, your computer, uh, your, your car, your whatever it is, your bed, take, away, take your attention away from everything, every place that you live, where you sleep, or you work, and you're not thinking about time. You're not thinking about your schedule, where you need to be, or what happened yesterday. You can relax into the present moment. There, there tends to be a dramatic change in the way the brain functions when people do this properly. We call it getting beyond yourself, but in a sense, you're dissociating from your three-dimensional mm -hmm. reality. Why? Because if you're thinking about anything in your three-dimensional reality, that's where your attention is and that's where your energy is, okay? so. We kind of figured out this formula when people really become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time. We are pretty much all of a sudden outside the constraints of the Newtonian world of got to do something to get an outcome. And if you can teach people how to linger there without a name, without a face, without a profession, without a family, without a culture, without a past, without a disease, you teach them how to be in this place we call the unknown, right? And you teach them that from that place, that invisible field, is where everything material comes from. And if they could create coherence in their brain, you need a strong signal in the brain. The more coherent the brain, the more stronger the signal. What do you mean a strong signal? Okay, let's see how I could say this. <laughs> when most people, we look at, when we look at brains in real time and we're looking at people's, how their, how their mind is working, when you're under stress, okay, stress is created by not being able to predict something that's mm -hmm. gonna happen in your life, uh, the perception that something's gonna get worse or you can't control something, right? So when that occurs, we switch on that primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system and the brain goes into this very alarmed state called high beta. That means pay attention to the outer world, there's danger out there. So it's, but if it's not a predator and it's traffic or your coworker or your ex, right. This is where it gets to be a problem because it becomes very maladaptive, right? Uh -huh. So when we're in that state and the brain is that, in that aroused state, 
we try to control and predict everything. So every person, every object, every thing, every place, uh, every, even your body has a neurological network in your brain, right? So as the arousal happens, we start shifting our attention to all these elements. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain starts firing very, very incoherently. And when the brain's incoherent, we're incoherent. It's so just not, that's not a strong signal. That's not, there's, it's a static on the wire. That's disconnection. There is mm -hmm. no signal. Right. So when we're in that state, we're always really looking for the worst case scenario of what's going to happen. Because mm -hmm. if you prepare for the worst, anything less happens, a better chance of survival, right? So, so in this kind of aroused state, as we shift our attention to each one of these elements that are known in our environment, the brain starts compartmentalizing and firing out of order. And, and, and that is what creates what's called autonomic dysregulation. That causes the brain and body to get really out of balance, right? So in that state, we're, we're over-focused. You know, when you're stressed, you're over-focused on something. You can't stop thinking about it. Our research shows that when you do that, you actually make your brain worse mm. because you're analyzing your problems within some disturbing emotion and that emotion is driving you further out of balance. You're actually knocking your brain and body out of balance by thought alone and you're driving it into these more aroused states, right? For someone that's been living like that for decades, that's their base mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. How do they even realize how to get out of that. They don't usually, it takes crisis, right? It takes right. trauma. Extreme breakdown. Yeah, breakdown. It's a does. loss, a death, yeah. a, All of a that. breakup, a divorce, a near... Bankruptcy, whatever. whatever it is, a disease, a diagnosis, whatever. Something where you just can't go on business as usual. Now it's time to really start looking, they, right? They have to wake up then. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's get back to the concept of yes. abundance here because... You need a strong signal in this field. Right. So then... If you can teach people to do the exact opposite, go from putting all of their attention on everything physical and material in the world of separation, and instead of narrowing their focus on something material, ask them to broaden their focus and put it on nothing. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but when you put your attention on space and you divert your attention, the act of sensing without thinking actually starts to slow the brain waves down. Mm -hmm. Not only slow it down, but all of a sudden cause the brain to start re reintegrating, starts to synchronize, right? And so you see different compartments of the brain that were firing out of order start to mm -hmm. resonate. They start to communicate. They're, 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 they're all of a sudden synchronizing. And what sinks in the brain kind of links in the brain. Mm -hmm. So when a person has their whole entire brain firing in rhythm, that's a very strong signal that you can send out into the field. If so when you, that signal is strong in that position, what can you create from that space? Okay, so, but that's only one element. Okay. So then the clear intention tends to be a very important element that we have to have to get down. And the more coherent the brain, the more clear the signal for that intention. So with intention and attention, we could actually make thought more real than anything else. Now, what is that? Mm. You're saying, what would it be like to be wealthy? What would it be like to be abundant? What would it be like to have all my needs met? What would it be like to have more than I need? Mm -hmm. What would I do if I had everything I ever wanted? The answer always is the same. You start giving stuff away. Because if an abundant person is truly right. abundant, why would they hold on? They would say, There's, I'm not in lack. There's more for everybody, okay? Turns out, though, that the signal sent out isn't enough. You got to have to draw the experience back to you. And so so sending the signal out to you know it's coherent brain, financial freedom, whatever abundance, that is. all these different right, things. Right, 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 right. Whatever that is for you. Whatever so that is for you. You're putting that out there with right. your signal, the, with the intention and the attention. Right. And then how do you draw okay, it so, to so you? Now, so, so in the physical world, right. the in the physical world, world you got to go get it. <laughs> you got to do something. This is the plane of demonstration. You got to go get it. And when you you're in lack until it occurs, right? Mm -hmm. But, so, but I'm hearing you say there's a way to not chase but attract. All right, so if you're creating from the field instead of from matter, right, there's a very strong possibility that you'll shorten the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of having it. And when there's a vibrational match between your energy and that future that you want to experience, now if you're creating from the field, you actually don't go anywhere to get it. Mm. You actually draw it to you. Mm. So the, here comes the synchronicities, <laughs> the serendipities, the coincidences, yes. the opportunities, and they come out of nowhere. And you, you say, I don't understand. I, I, I didn't do anything. Well, you changed your energy. And, and so then 
the, the other element is a coherent heart, right? Mm -hmm. And the heart has a magnetic signature. And the magnetic signature is what draws reality to us, right? So you combine that clear intention with a coherent brain. Now here's the key. This takes practice. Yes. Because the person who's living in lack is usually unworthy, is usually insecure, is usually in their past, they're usually frustrated, they're usually impatient, they're usually resentful because nothing's changing out there because it's taking too long. Well, that's mm. everything takes a lot of time when you do matter to matter, right? So then if you teach them, okay, we know all about that. We know the story behind yeah, that. We know what your, your parents past, told yeah. you about money, all that other, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But now let's do something that would be really cool. Let's, let's write down the feelings of how you would feel if that future happened and you're going to have to feel that feeling before it occurs. So now, okay, what does a, an abundant person feel? Pretty much free, a lot of free, freedom. Peace, peace, excited, joyful. Uh, uh, um, in love with life, mm -hmm. grateful to be alive, abundant. Okay, now let's practice mm -hmm. feeling those. Turns out when you're feeling those other emotions like resentment and impatience and frustration, you're stepping on the gas pedal, you're just turning on the sympathetic nervous system and you're stepping on the brake. At which the same is, time. At the same time, which is oh. you're angry, you're frustrated, but the fight or flight nervous system says run, fight or hide and you're sitting in a Zoom meeting and you're neck is pulsating is because the heart is beating against the closed system, right? You're not, you're not using it in an adaptive way. So mm. the heart starts firing out of order. It starts firing incoherently and incoherent waves cancel each other out. It's called destructive interference and then we stop trusting our future. Energy leaves the heart. Energy leaves the brain, energy leaves the heart. And you can't get in touch with the feeling of your future because in survival, which those are hormones of stress, all those emotions, in survival, it's not a time to create, right? It's time to run, fight, and hide. Okay, so we gotta lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want. The habit of doing it that way for something greater to occur, okay? And what happens if we create, try to create from survival emotions? It just takes a long time. You just, you, you'll just force it. Little, yeah. bit, little steps at a time. You'll force it, yeah. you'll, you'll force it, you'll fight for it, you'll compete for it, and you'll manipulate, you'll cheat, you'll lie. Uh, you'll do anything to get what you want because that's what matter does when it's trying to change matter. And everybody's, everybody's playing that game, right? Everybody's trying to c accumulate the most amount of things. Mm, right. Okay, so that's what abundance means to certain people. Get as many things as you can. Okay. You want that? Not a problem. But let's learn the formula of how to create, right? Yes. So then, So then you'd have to feel those emotions before the experience occurred. And if you understood that you could dissociate all of your attention from this three-dimensional reality and have no attention on anything known and understand that it's the field that creates matter, mm -hmm. not matter that emits the field. And if you could get to that place and change your energy with a clear intention and elevated emotion, your heart starts beating in this beautiful rhythm like a drum. We've measured it so many times. And when that occurs, the next thing that happens, the heart informs the brain it's safe to create now. So the person Gosh. relaxes into the present moment. And then we see this, like if you took a big sheet, you know, and a blanket and you went like that, the energy of the heart actually informs the brain to move into these beautiful, elegant states of alpha brainwave patterns, mm. coherent alpha. And that's saying, what's the next dream? What is it, the next, what's the next opportunity you want to experience? That's a state of creation. So now you have a Wi-Fi signal. You got a coherent brain, that's a directive, that's a signal out. And you got this coherent heart. That's what draws it to us, right? You combine those two and if there's a vibrational match between your energy and that potential in the quantum field and you're feeling abundant and whatever your brain associates with being abundant, that's your call. That's what the creative process is. This is the creative center. The brain the frontal lobe actually says, what would it be like to be creative or, or abundant? I don't know what it'd be like to be abundant. Well, then go read a few books on people who, who actually became abundant and realized it wasn't a glorious process. They mm. failed miserably. They, let, they got betrayed. They learned a lot of lessons, but they persevered. Mm -hmm. And what are the qualities 
of that person that you could embody. That, that's the key, right? Because it's, it's not about wealth. It's who you become, mm-hmm. right? Because people think it's about their wealth, but it's the becoming process. It's the overcoming. That attracted that, right? Of course. So then, so then you got to turn the battleship around because most people say, I can't feel grateful for my wealth because it hasn't happened yet. That's the hypnosis. Waiting for the experience to happen to feel grateful. Well, that's Newtonian. That's three-dimensional reality. That's cause and effect. The quantum, you got to feel it in order for you to experience it. Okay, so this heart becomes like an amplifier, and it sends that signal out, and that frequency can carry the thought of your abundance. Can suffering cannot carry the thought of your abundance? Lack cannot carry the thought of your abundance. It's, it's a different frequency, right? We feel different feelings like suffering. We think different thoughts, right? So, so people can say, "I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant," all they want, but that thought is never making it to the body because it's stopping at the brainstem because the body's saying, "I'm miserable." I'm unhappy, Mm -hmm. I'm in lack, right? So so the affirmation doesn't work, right? Okay, so let's go one step further. Yes. So if you practice this, and you actually understood, you know, well, well, we teach this pretty well, but if you you learned it just like learning how to play handball, or Mm -hmm. learning how to hit a golf ball, learning how to dance a salsa, if you just practice the form, you got really good at it. If you were doing it properly then, what would be the outcome? The experiment of being abundant would be that you would have to feel that feeling. It's so good at doing it with your eyes closed. Mm-hmm. You gotta do it with your eyes open. Now why? <laughs> because if you're feeling the feelings of your emotions, of your future, you're no longer looking for them. Because you you're in the future now. Your, your body is so objective that it's believing it's living in that reality yes. where you are abundant. And as long as you feel that emotion, you're not separate from it any longer. You're no longer in lack. You're no longer looking for it to occur, occur. Say, why hasn't it happened yet? If you're feeling abundant, why would you look? Right? You, you, you right. Wouldn't, so, so, so then our job then is to be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body. So, okay. So does that mean like you should check your bank account tomorrow and see if there's a half a million dollars in it? No. You keep tuning into that potential, and then here come the synchronicities. Yes. What's that? That's feedback in your environment. It's the universe saying, hey, Lewis, whatever you're doing, all of a sudden, <laughs> we are starting to create, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's so important for people to remember that they're the creators of their lives instead of the victim of their lives, mm-hmm. right? So the victim is saying, I'm feeling this way because that person or that circumstance or I don't have any money is causing me to feel this way. That's my relationship with money. What that really means is I'm using my lack to reaffirm my dependency, my addiction, my conditioning. That's my relationship with money is that I put my attention on money because I don't have it. Mm -hmm. So their relationship with money is of course built on lack. And so when they don't have it, they feel bad. And what they're really saying is, my outer environment, my reality is actually controlling the way I feel and the way I think. So, Lewis, why are you in a good mood today? Things are going good. Why in a bad mood? Things are going bad today. So, this unconscious program of victimization is saying that, that, that we're, we're allowing our environment to influence the way we feel and the way we think. Isn't that, isn't that what victimization is? And, and the stronger the emotion we have to our lack, the more we put our attention on the fact that we don't have it, right? So then the person has forgotten that they're creating reality because what they're creating is lack. And they're creating more of it. And then they try harder and they force harder and they control more. And they're more more. exhausted and their body's tired. And and they're breaking down, right. So so the experiment then is, let's try it another way. Let's create from the field instead of from matter. Get a coherent heart, get a coherent brain, relax in the heart, and energy moves right into the brain. We've measured this a thousand times. And all of a sudden, the person moves into these beautiful, elegant brainwave states where they're super creative, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the longer you're conscious of that energy, the more you draw that future to you. So then, what does the synchronicity mean? It means whatever you're doing inside of you is producing that effect outside of you. Pay attention to what you did. Keep doing and do more it again. Yeah. So generate a little bit more abundance. Just uh-huh. do it for an experiment. Now, when the synchronicity happens, do you think you feel suffering or do you think you feel a little excitement? You feel inspired, right? Mm-hmm. So then that synchronicity is saying, use this energy, use this feeling. It should be easier for you to feel this now and go back and do it again. Mm-hmm. Keep the experiment going. Then here comes the promotion. Here comes the, here comes the email. Here mm-hmm. comes the person you meet at the right time, yes. right? Whoa, we have something happening here. And then that, that becomes the momentum, right? So then 
we generate abundance. That's that's how we do it. And the relationship it doesn't just happen by accident. We generate it. We generate abundance, right? So then, if you have an hour meditation where you're tuning into your abundant future, but then you're spending the other fifteen hours a day in lack, don't expect anything to change. You defaulted. Mm -hmm. You're back to the old energy. And if you say it's that person or that circumstance or that bank account, I'm going to say you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim, right? Mm -hmm. So then, so then, so then let's go a step further. If your personality creates your personal reality, and it does, and your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel, then the present personality who's listening to this podcast has created the present personal reality called their life. Nothing big there. Which means if you want to change your personal reality, you're going to have to change your personality. Right. Nothing changes in your life until you change. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, 95% of who we are is is on autopilot. Right. It's it's a programmed thoughts, hardwired thoughts, beliefs, perceptions, unconscious habits and behaviors, and really, really emotional responses that tend to be really knee jerk and automatic. Right. So. If 95% of who we are is a set of unconscious programs, then the first step to change is becoming conscious of those unconscious thoughts. Now, people think when they sit down to do the work and make their change that they're, they're doing something wrong. No, those thoughts have to come up. I can, I'm not worthy, it's never going to work. But a person who's truly persevering towards their abundance realizes just because they have that thought doesn't mean it's true. They're curious on what's on the other side of that thought. Ah, well, that's just the thought, right? Mm -hmm. And nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. So you keep moving past that thought, it, gets, it has less and less power over you, right? Uh, now, you're, you have power over it, or, or better, better yet, you're using your brain in the proper way instead of your, being a victim to your brain, sure. right? If you complain about money, if you judge people who have it, if you rush when you're in lack, if you cheat when you don't have what you need, an abundant person doesn't do that. You got to look at that and say, I got to break these habits. Yes. Oh my God, if I truly want to be abundant, I can't act this way. Now, here's the big one. <laughs> if, if I truly want to be a new personality that's in a new personal reality, I can't take lack with me. I can't take unworthiness. I can't take the story that goes along with it with my parents or my grandparents mm -hmm. or, or my ex or whatever. That story has to end, right? I mean, if not now, when, right? How do people end those stories? Well, of course. Well, how many times do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? Right. That's the game, right? Mm -hmm. That's the game called change. How many times do we have to go unconscious and default to that old personality when we catch ourselves and stop doing that and get conscious? That's the moment of change. Mm -hmm. So. The problem is, is that most people wake up in the morning and they think, uh, let me think of my problems, right? The, the brain is a record of the past, right? So they think about their problems. They don't have enough money. And those, those problems are usually connected to certain people at certain places mm -hmm. with certain objects and certain things. What didn't work time. out or who screwed right. me so, over. Or so like, the yeah. moment they wake up, the moment they remember those problems, they're thinking in the past. Mm. So now they're firing and wiring the memory. They're keeping the memory of the past alive in their mind. The problem is every one of those memories has an emotion associated with it because we've experienced it. So when they feel the lack, when they feel the unhappiness, when they feel the anxiety, now the body's in the past. Thoughts being the language of the brain, feelings being the language of the body, how we think and how we feel creates our state of being. But the conditioning process starts because conditioning only needs a thought and a feeling, a memory or an image and an emotion and a stimulus and a response, and you're conditioning your body to become mm. the mind of that emotion. And now the, the memory's not in the brain. Now the memory's buried subconsciously in the body, and the body becomes the mind of that emotion. So the body is living in lack, and it's believing. It's the body is—is is that through the nervous system or is that through neurochemical the cells? Everything. everything. So, the, so, so the body's so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating the lack and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone called lack. Mm. The body's believing it's living the same past experience every day. It's a, it, it, why? Because the end product of an experience is an emotion. Mm -hmm. oh, well, if you if your life is changing, but you're still feeling lack, don't expect anything that you you won't even see it. You'll walk right past it. You're viewing 
your life through the lens of the past. Okay, so okay, so then a person realizes that all their friends are making money and they're doing stuff, and they're like, "Wow, I'm really feeling lack now." So then, when it no longer becomes about your abundance, and it becomes about your change, that's a valuable moment. When it's no longer about your healing, but it's about your change. I paid attention to a lot of people in, in the last couple of years tell their story. The people who heal in this work from cancers and all kinds of chronic health conditions and Parkinson's and strokes and paralysis and all kinds of things, it's rare genetic disorders. It, it never was about, when they've really got in the game, it was never about their healing. It was about what do I need to change in order to heal? When the game goes like that, so then the person who's feeling lack, on some level or another, it's not just in the mind, it's in the body, right? So let me, say, let me hear you say that again. When someone's looking for abundance, it's never about the abundance, it's about the change they need to make for no, healing? No, the, the ch what, I'm using healing as an example, yes. but let's use abundance as an example. Yes. When, when you understand that you cannot get abundant, when it's no longer about the game called abundance, it's about the game called change. Mm -hmm. What do I need to change? The more I change, the more I'll be abundant. Yes. So then it's no longer, why well, haven't, how come it hasn't happened? That's the old personality, separate mm -hmm. from the experience, still in lack, asking that question. Which is creating your current reality. Which is, which is reaffirming it because that's the lens you're perceiving it through. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. So we should be focusing more on what we need to change every moment as opposed to the abundance or the healing. Well, the word meditation means to become familiar with. Sit with yourself long enough and not turn on your cell phone, not right. scroll through your social media, do no TikTok, no emails, no, none of that stuff. Don't Just sit and close your eyes and, and watch the thoughts that come up. Those, that's the exact reason why you're not abundant. Watch what you want to do when you're feeling lack to take away the lack and there's always something you would do to, to take it away. But, but sit with the lack and be curious on what's on the other side of it, mm -hmm. right? Because the body's programmed into lack now subconsciously, right? So the emotion of lack drives our thoughts and drives our behaviors. So it makes sense then that if an emotion is a record of the past, then we're doing things habitually from the past. Mm -hmm. We're thinking in the past, right? So. So lower the volume to the emotion every time you notice lack comes up. And just like breaking any addiction, there's going to be cravings, right? So the body's going, <laughs> yeah. hey, Lewis, it's been about two hours since you're you You're so used to doing this so, Yeah, thing. you've been thinking lacking thoughts about 150,000 times a day, and you're just going to stop now. <laughs> the body's going to start influencing the mind and say, yes. it's not going to work. You're a loser. It didn't work before. It's too hard. Or everybody else. That's, that's why it's so hard for people to like lose weight or get in shape. Same, because you might try it for a few days, and then the cravings, or I'm tired, and I want to go default back into the old personality. Right, because why? Because the body, which has been conditioned, the mind, the body is the unconscious mind. So the body's got used to the familiar feeling. Even mm -hmm. They don't even know it's lack. It's just how they feel. So it's not guilt. So, okay, right. so let me finish. How does so, yeah, okay, ahead. so the hardest part about all of this is making a different choice. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Right. It's going to feel unfamiliar. Your your body's all of a sudden saying, hey, Lewis, uh, why don't you start thinking those same exact thoughts, mm -hmm. do the same things, make the same choices, demonstrate the same behaviors, have the same experiences. So you could feel that feeling of lack. Complain again to somebody, call somebody up and say how, how miserable your right. life is, right? right. And that's, that's the known, right? So the body is always influencing the mind to return back to the familiar territory. The default. Yeah. The default, okay. All right, so now the person says, okay, what thoughts do I not want? What, what would an abundant person think this way? The people in our work that have mm. created, I had a guy come to our event. I, I love this guy. He healed himself. Of, he, he tried to take his life three times. When he, he told me that when he came to our work, he didn't have $2 to rub together. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars wow. now. And he just keeps giving it away. Wow. His, his lesson his lesson was, no, it wasn't the wealth, it was who he became. So it's the overcoming process that is the becoming process. Right? Who did he become in that journey? Exactly. He had to get beyond all of those thoughts of his past, all the mistakes he made, all the things he did wrong, all the money he owed there, all of that. That was like, he just had to no longer be that person any mm -hmm. longer. 
but he did say, how would a wealthy person live? And, and, and when he created his wealth, what do you think the first thing he did? Started giving? Giving it away. Why? Because an abundant person doesn't have any lack. Mm-hmm. And he knows how to create more of it. And that's, he's in the experiment. Well, what would happen if I keep giving it away? He keeps getting more. That's a good experiment to have because he is actually living in that abundant state. He also had tremendous healings taking place because when you heal your heart, you heal your mind. I mean, it's just the way it is. We saw it so many times, right? So he healed his heart. He got an wow. upgrade. He got an upgrade, right? Yeah. So then the, the next fundamental question is, how would an abundant person think? Write it down, dude, and fire and wire those thoughts in your brain and install the hardware. Keep doing it with attention and intention. It becomes the new voice in your head. It becomes a software program. Then say, okay, how am I going to be in my life today? What would an abundant person, how would they behave? And before you reach for your cell phone and start scrolling through your social media, close your eyes and rehearse in your mind how that person would walk how they would breathe, how they would smile, how they would Mm. greet people, how they would be on Zoom calls, how would they be in traffic, how would they be at dinner? And and the act of closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing the act. Mm. If you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining. In fact, just a little bit of time, you start to install the neurological hardware to look like you already did it. Now the brain is no longer a record of the past. It's primed for the future. Keep doing it. Keep rehearsing. No different than playing an instrument. No different than learning how to dance. No different than learning how to act uh, or play a sport. Everybody's Mm -hmm. always rehearsing, right? The rehearsal process changes the brain to look like you've already done it. You've already experienced it. Now what's the essential part of that? The hardware is in place. Now all you gotta do is step into the footprint. Mm. Keep doing it, it becomes a software program. You start acting like an abundant person. Everything changes, your energy changes, your mood changes, the way you walk, the way you breathe, your posture changes. You're out of the known, right? You gotta condition the body now emotionally into the future. Can't open your eyes in the morning until you are feeling (laughs) worthy to receive. And if you can't feel worthy to receive, then if not now, when? Mm -hmm. If it takes you two hours to get there, ask me if it's worth 30 years of running, trying to get what you need matter to matter. Okay, so then the person who wrestles with their lack, they're out of the bleachers and they're on the playing field. Here's what we learned. Here's what we learned. Let's go back to beliefs now. So remember, belief is just the thought you keep thinking over and over again. A belief is something that you keep thinking enough times that you hardwired in your brain and it becomes an automatic program. And we have beliefs about all kinds of things, money, relationships, God, whatever it is. It's all based on what we've been told or our past experiences, right? The boundaries of those beliefs are our emotions, right? So let's just say you got betrayed or somebody abused you or Mm -hmm. your father told you that money was bad and there's never enough of it or whatever. That's a story, okay? But, but somehow it left an impression on you. Remember that event very clearly, and that's kind of rooted in who you are, right? Okay, so that emotion then is the boundary of our belief, okay? So how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. If you take a thought and a feeling, 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 that's called an attitude. A series <laughs> of good thoughts with a series of good feelings, you say, I have a good attitude today. You have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to a series of negative feelings. You say, I have a bad attitude today. So attitudes are just shortened states of being. Good attitude in the morning, bad attitude in the afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you keep those up, and you string attitudes together, you create what's called a belief. Mm-hmm. And a belief is just an extended state of being. So if you keep thinking the same thought, you keep hardwiring it in the brain, you keep feeling the same feeling, you keep conditioning in your body, the redundancy of that cycle over and over again conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind of that belief. And all beliefs are subconscious states of being. Mm. Okay. Take a belief, a belief, a belief, and you string them together. You form what's called a perception. And perceptions are just such extended states of being that we're unconscious, and so then we, we edit out reality. In fact, most people don't see things the way they are, they see things the way they are, yes. right? And people are always filling in reality unconsciously based on their memory. 
They could be married to a person for 40 years and they don't see the person, they see the memory of the person, right? Mm -hmm. And there's research to prove this, okay? So how do we change a belief or perception about ourselves or our lives, okay? We've studied this. Okay, let's just say that lack is ingrained in there. You got the story, you lived on the streets, you lost everything, you got betrayed, your business partner took everything, took your wife, took, you got the story in the half, yes. okay? Okay, you gotta start telling the new story of the future, right? You gotta believe in that future more than you have to believe in the past. So how do you do that? Mm -hmm. You only believe in the past when you feel the emotions of the past. The only time you're gonna believe in the future is when you feel the emotions of the future, right? Okay, so in order for us to change a belief or perception about ourselves and our lives, we have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in uh -huh. your brain and the emotional conditioning in your body. And your body literally has to respond to your mind. That the choice that you're making to change in that moment becomes a moment in time that you never forget. And here's the key. Physically. Physically. The stronger the emotion you feel when you make that choice, the more you'll remember the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then how do we downregulate that old belief? If the trauma created an emotional quotient of six or seven, then your decision to change your beliefs got to be a nine. Right. And you got to come out of your resting state and that moment has to define you. You could say, I know exactly where I was, the time and day it was, who I was with, when I made my mind up to change, mm -hmm. right? Because you created a long-term memory. Long-term memories are created with from strong emotion, emotion yes. right? But if the amplitude of that emotion is greater than the betrayal, Boom, the body starts responding to the mind and you're actually giving your body a taste of the future emotionally. So you brand your- What's you, possible. No, your body's actually getting the taste of that future event. It's experiencing the future now. Now, exactly. Big yeah. explosion in the quantum field, wow. big explosion. So the side effect of that is if you combine that clear intention with that elevated emotion, you're basically remembering your future and it looks no different than remembering your past. Think neurologically within the circuits of that memory and feel within the emotions of that new belief and watch your life begin to change because nothing changes in our life that we change. And when we change our energy, we change our life. So now the experiment all of a sudden is no longer based on it being hard or trying or wishing or wanting mm -hmm. or hoping. That's what we do when we're lack or in lack or separation. It's about change. So then when we finally realize in order for us to become abundant, we have to overcome the old personality. And that's 95% of who we are, right? Yes. So then the side effect of the beginning of this process is a lot of discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of discomfort because you're stepping outside the known into the unknown and now you can't predict. It's scary. No, no, it's you'd, ra you'd so. rather hold on to your lack. The pain, the suffering. Rather tell the story of that. At least it makes you feel something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. When you step outside and you're saying, I'm not gonna complain about money any longer. I'm not gonna complain about I don't have any. I'm not gonna judge other people who do. I'm not gonna say I can, I'm not worthy. It's never gonna work. All those things gotta go. I'm not gonna feel lack. I'm not gonna feel unworthy. I'm not gonna feel separation. I'm not gonna feel resentment. These are the things that are keeping my reality the same. Now it's no longer about abundance, about who you become. Mm -hmm. So the overcoming process becomes the becoming process. And so many people come to this work, they want abundance, they want healing, they want a new relationship, they want a new career, they want the mystical, but really they want wholeness. And, and they want healing, they want peace. They want, they want wholeness. Because they feel on whole. Well, well, when you're in lack or you're in separation, you're not whole. Mm. Imagine feeling so much wholeness that's impossible to want. That's what our that's what we're working on with people. Then you can really enjoy a sunset. Then you can really enjoy a meal. Mm. Then you can really enjoy your friends. Then you can I, I I I talk to people that are very abundant. I mean, in the billions abundant. And you know, so many of them say we are in misery. We're, our whole. we're in agony because they can't enjoy life anymore. That's what they want. I mean, people want abundance to be able to enjoy life. They want to be able to do whatever they want with whoever they want as many times as they want wherever they want. That's freedom, right? Or people want abundance. The sponsoring thought is really they want freedom, right? Or whatever their sponsoring thought would be, right? So 
So then creating from the field instead of from matter to shorten the distance between cause and effect requires that clear intention with that elevated emotion, coherent brain and coherent heart. Tune into that energy and feel it with your brain and your heart. I mean, we have plenty of ways to do that. Examine your personality and examine your personal reality. Change your personality, change your personal reality. Don't make it be about abundance, mm -hmm. make it about becoming abundant by overcoming the person who's not abundant. The person who heals themselves from a health condition, who's no longer thinking the same way, no longer acting the same way, no longer feeling the same way. You ask them where that disease is when they stand on the stage in front of 1,500 people or 3,000 people, and that's a four minute mile. Everybody's leaning in, that's truth right on the stage. They say, where is that, where is the disease? Oh, it lives in the old person. Wow. I, I'm somebody else. I, yeah. I, that's like, that's, I don't even, that's not even a story. That's not even who I am any longer. So lo and behold, when we do our research, and people do this, in seven days of going all in, at the end of seven days, their body looks like, genetically, with all the metabolites, that they're literally in a different environment. You know, here's the weird part. Mm -hmm. They're in a ballroom. Right. There's not a lot happening in a ballroom. Right, right. What's happening in a ballroom? I've been to thousands of ballrooms. Yeah. But the environment somehow looks like they're living in a very prosperous, very healthy, very loving, nurturing, very whole environment. Why? Because they were signaling genes ahead of the environment. Mm -hmm. And if the environment signals the gene, okay, that's epigenetics. The end product of the experience in the environment is an emotion. If you feel the emotion before the experience, you're signaling the gene ahead of the environment. And genes make proteins. And proteins are responsible for the structure and the function of your body. Look at, Jack by, the, look at Jack, by the way. I like that. Look at that muscle over here. <laughs> the expression of proteins is the expression of life. So you actually become abundant. Mm. You actually become that person. And people who are truly abundant have no problem with losing things. I was going to ask you next was, let's say you make a million dollars in your business, but then you invest a lot in the stock market or whatever, and then half of it goes away overnight. Who doesn't have that happen? Right. Every abundant person has that happen. Right. And, and, and their response is minimal. So what should be, people be thinking when they lose a lot of money or they lesson, lose something? Don't lose the lesson. Uh, you may lose the money, but don't lose the lesson. Should people feel this emotional attachment to the money no, loss? No, why? Or just why? Say, what, okay. is, what is money? I mean, what is that? What people really want. It's like people say to me, oh, I have this great idea for this new business and, and I need money. And I say, you don't need money. You need opportunity. Mm -hmm. You need opportunity. You better tune in to some opportunities, right? So it's the framing of how limited we think that we have to get things through money. It just is not the way it is. Yeah. So the fundamental importance about all of this is I, I really don't care if people want to be abundant. I don't care if they want to heal. I don't care if they want to have a mystical. I don't care what, when I travel the world. It doesn't matter to me. I just want them to be in the experiment. The experiment of actually trying it out yes. and seeing, God, if I really change my energy, well, could I actually have an effect that's produced in my life? And if I'm waiting for the event to occur, I'm back to the illusion of separation and lack, mm -hmm. waiting for it to happen, to take it away, if I'm truly a creator. So let's say, let's say they're not waiting. What should they do instead of waiting? Keep feeling the feeling in the present moment and trust. Look, right? if, you're, will, if you're waiting, you're not creating. I mean, that's just the mm -hmm. way it is. So wake up every day. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want your dream? It's so much easier to forget that vision than to remember it, right? So yes. if you're gonna remember it, you gotta keep it alive in your mind. How do you keep it alive in your mind? You, you disconnect from your environment, you close your eyes, you play music in the background. You get, sit your body down and it's gotta pee and it's gotta eat and it's gotta, well, you just, <laughs> just sit down for a few minutes, yes. like training a dog, like yeah. stay. When I say it's time to get up, we get up. Don't be thinking about what's gonna happen in your day. You already know what's gonna happen. Don't think what happened yesterday. You already know that. Get in the present moment and say, who do I wanna be when I open my eyes? Who do I wanna be today? What would mm -hmm. greatness look like? Right. How, how, would, how would I, how would, one day, one shot, one lifetime, what would an abundant person do? Let me rehearse that with my eyes closed. Let me remind myself who I don't wanna be. Let me remind myself of who do I wanna be. Let's not get up, Lewis. Until we get into that. Until we are, to where the tennis ball hits the sweet spot. When you go, oh, I'm ready for the day now. Now, 
game on. Now, if you can maintain that modified state of mind and body the entire day without defaulting by seeing someone or doing something, stay in that state, the experiment still continues. And you're changing your energy. Doesn't happen in two days, you're not that good. Right. That's it, you're not that good. We keep practicing. Keep, people who show up the, for the 21 weeks in a row, this woman, 21 weeks in a row, the end of 21 weeks, she knew it. Boom, her whole life changed, boom. Was it 21 days worth it? Ask her. The experiment, she was just changing the process. People who diagnose with really serious health conditions and they start doing the meditations and they realize, wow, God, my body feels better, my pain feels better, but my values, my scans are still showing the disease exists. All right, did it, does it mean that it doesn't work? No, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means like, what am I doing the other 15 hours of the day? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm in lack, I'm in fear, I'm responding to the same people in the same uh -huh. ways. And you gotta think about this. As long as your response to everything in your life is the same, you're not changing. Right. So change your response to things in your life and you're in the process of change. So then, now I gotta get good with my eyes open. Now I gotta be able to rehearse, oh my God, I fell from grace. At that moment in my day, oh my God, I defaulted back mm -hmm. to the old self. Forgive I went back. yourself, yeah. All right, no, so it's not it's only forgive yourself. Like There's a forgiving process like, shoot, but if you're truly playing the game, who cares, mm -hmm. right? You just go, oh God, let me brush myself off. Get back to get it. Back, yeah. Let me get back in my heart here. Let me get back in that place. Let me remember, let me get back in this energy, and let's try it again. Let's try it again. Yes. And, and let's just keep the experiment going. Now, does that mean you have to be irresponsible? No, you still have to navigate with ethics and morality. You still have to have personal conviction. You still have to have a vision that's bigger than you and somehow that motivates you because not only you're doing it for selfish reasons, but to contribute to others in some way. Of course, there's gonna be recognition and popularity and aggrandizement that goes with it. Money should be the side effect mm -hmm. of all that. The game should be so good of your vision, like that vision of the future, you have to keep alive in your mind. That should be the game. The you ones mean, that can keep that vision of the future in their mind now. Exactly. And, and have yeah. a personality. Even if, you're, even if your reality is falling apart, right. and that's happened to a lot of people. I mean, there are people that come through our work that are living in the back of their car. Right. And now they're, you know, th living very well or, or th sure. bankrupt. And now they're, you know, their companies are thriving, just thriving. Yeah. They just, they just never stopped believing in themselves because if you believe in yourself, it means you have to believe in possibility. And if you believe in possibility, you're gonna to have to believe in yourself. And so something really cool happens when you do this that I just discovered recently, just watching people at our week-long events, um, you know, cause you gotta go all in, you gotta go all in. And it's seven days and it's a lot and it's super intense and there's times where you don't wanna show up because I'm pushing mm. people across the river of change. There comes a moment where people keep showing up for themselves. They keep showing up for themselves in spite of the weather, in spite of their foot hurting, in spite of their bad dream, in spite of the whatever, their fight with or whoever, they keep showing up. They get really worthy to receive. They, it's no, they feel really worthy, like I am worthy to receive this gift. And the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving, right? So we gotta get to that point because so many people who are in lack somehow don't feel worthy, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the abundance then becomes the sign that you finally become worthy. And in the, for the soul, it's not about the abundance. It's about mastering your worthiness. Mm. And the reflection Man. is the things that you accumulate. What's, the, what's the, the strategy to start believing we're worthy of receiving now? Is there Fill a... your brain with as much knowledge as possible. And, and be, listen, my dad used to say this to me all the time. He'd say, wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second, just sit down with me here. If anybody else can do it, you could do it also. Mm. Well, let's just start there. So how did these people do it? Like, let's look at what they did. Right. All right, let's study. We are, this is a school of greatness. Yeah. Let's study greatness. What, what is greatness? Like an uncompromising will, invincibility, right. lead with their heart, adapt and make changes, let go of the past, give, you, give, give life, live it fully and completely and embrace it and enjoy it. I don't know, whatever, you get to write the script. Yeah. And you, you tell the story of your future instead of telling the story of your past, watch mm, what my happens. Gosh. What is, so how do we, 
Should we be speaking to others about our future or should we be more keeping that to our mind and our bodies and kind of speaking it to ourselves? What happens when you say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this yeah, and this yeah. is my future. Does it's that a, actually it's hurt a great us? Question. Yeah. So I really don't leak it out. Yeah, I never yeah. leak it out because so if I'm working on you. something, yeah. I hold it. Right. I don't want to. I don't. I, I'll, when it when I know it's going to happen, that's when I'll say, "Hey, you guys, this is, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, right?" So it's more to yourself, right? Listen, you future. know when you know when you're changing, when you stop talking about it. That's when you know you're changing because you're at, you're at the bleachers and you're on the playing field. Look, look, so many people come to our work, Lewis, and they say, "I I always believed that this." was possible all this information it seems i've seen people heal them some people create well uh, i i get it i just didn't believe it would work for me mm. oh it's a big moment it's a it's a big moment now now you are on the game you're in are you in the playing field you're, yes. you're out of the bleachers like like we had people stand on the stage someone stand on the stage this weekend in denver just said my god i i <laughs> i I really believe that that um, this would work. I just I just didn't believe I could heal. I didn't believe. I really didn't believe it. I really didn't believe. She was a physician. Is a physician. I really didn't believe I could heal. Now, is it about the healing anymore? It's about overcoming the belief. Mm -hmm. Every day, she's got to make that decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision is causing her body to respond to her mind. And that's the moment she's rewriting the belief. And if, if she doesn't feel like it, don't expect anything to occur in your life. You got to come out of your resting state. You got to, you got to make that choice. What do you, for the, all the people that go to your events, uh, and just in life, one of the biggest challenges people have is the consistency of doing these things. Yes. It's hard to actually go and try it once. No, That's but, but here's, the deal. How here's do you the deal. Stay accountable? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Yeah. Let's just say you're in the experiment. Uh -huh. And now that belief is right in your face. I guarantee you that discomfort from that belief being right in your face is going to get you out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. and you're going to face off with it. There's an, there's an innate capacity that we have as human beings to want to overcome our limitations. It's in there, right? So the community that, that we have that does this work, they're not like, oh God, I've got to go create today. <laughs> That's not their game. The magic is so good. They show up because they don't want the magic to end. To go away, yeah. They don't, they, they're not doing it as a have to, to please God, do the right thing, be spiritual. None of that. None, it's not an obligation. It's something that they actually look forward to doing because the experiment in their life is creating all these wonderful opportunities. And, and there's plenty of people in our work that started new businesses that are sure. jam they're jamming. Yeah, yeah. They're jamming. They're jamming. They're and, jamming. And, and they would never be victim to those circumstances, right? They just wouldn't let them, those circumstances define them, right? Yes. What defined them was the vision of the future. And that vision they had to keep alive and the emotion mm. was the energy that drove them right to it. If you enjoyed that interview, then I know you'll love what we have coming up right now. There was a, a researcher uh, out of Yale University that uh, in the 1940s, it was studying electromagnetic fields around living organisms. And in the 1940s in Yale, at Yale University, nobody was doing this. And he was a, a vitalist. He wanted to understand the unseen fields around living organisms. So he started studying eggs, all kinds of eggs. Chicken eggs, you know, swallow eggs, reptile eggs, snake eggs, salamander eggs. There's all kinds of eggs. And he was using a magnetometer. And what he found was what 100% of the time, no matter what egg he measured, the positive charge was always at the head mm -hmm. and the negative charge was always at the tail. Well, if you have positive charge on one end and negative charge on the other end, you got an external electromagnetic field called the magnetic field. That's a magnet, right? What happens with human beings is every thought has a frequency. Every thought produces a chemical. So if you keep obsessing about your lack, your lack of finances, your lack of time, your lack of energy, lack, 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 and, and those thoughts. I don't have this, I, I don't need know. this, What, I what are this. the chemicals you're feeding your body? You're taking thought, it's producing a frequency, and that frequency in the form of chemistry is storing that thought emotionally right in your second center. 
you feel guilty, you feel unhappy. The moment you feel unhappy, then you generate more thoughts equal to that feeling, which makes more chemicals, and you keep taking energy from the brain and storing it in the body. If you react to people in your life, and you feel anger, frustration, whether it's traffic, the news, whatever it is. Parents, you, parents, whatever, girl, what, you're drawing from this field, this electromagnetic field, you're tapping that resource and you're making chemistry out of it and the field shrinks. So now, mm. by doing that and living in survival, the body no longer is a magnet. So now you have very little energy in the brain. In fact, 5% of the energy is in the brain. And 95% is stored in the body. Now, the body's been conditioned emotionally. So, a lot of energy in the body, very little in the brain. Mm. So, in our work... Do we want energy to be in the brain? We want to move energy back up to the brain. So what does that do when we move the energy from the body to the brain or the heart? Well, this is a great thing because once it makes it here, it's going up, oh. right? So, we do these different meditations and these different techniques to draw that energy right up to the top of the head. Now, when this energy shakes loose, and it starts to move, the sympathetic nervous system switches on. And instead of releasing energy out, like you're being chased by a predator or you're, you're having an orgasm, that same energy is going up into the brain and the brain switches on and it goes into these very high, high frequencies called gamma brainwave patterns. Now the person has an arousal, but the arousal isn't fear. Not an orgasm. Well, in the brain. An, an an orgasm of the mind. Yeah, exactly. It's it's energy that's being that released into the brain. Mm. And you can only describe it as ecstasy or bliss. So the energy of guilt that was stored from thinking and feeling in the same way releases and it travels up to the brain and it's going back. And when it reaches the brain, what happens? You get more energy in the brain and it begins to produce that external field, so you're you're beginning to create a field around your body. You can imagine the future as opposed to staying in something from the past. Well, so. once the energy's moved, you're, you're you're going to feel you're going to feel pretty blessed in that moment. In fact, so we can transfer guilt, shame, insecurities can, into bliss. Oh my God, yeah, we do it all the time. Momentarily. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, we do it all the time. And the the amazing thing is that that rush of energy that's moving into the brain is changing the brain's physiology and producing that field. Now you have energy to heal. Mm. Now the body is a magnet again. And it's as the energy moves up the spinal cord and it starts passing through those spinal nerves and there's a lot of dynamics going on on the body, that energy that was once stored in, in that one of those energy centers that's released is energy to heal, energy to create a new future. You're replenishing your field and now the body becomes more of a magnet instead of an inert piece of metal with no charge, right? So the person then who's reacting to whatever person or circumstance in their life, the stronger the emotion that they feel towards politics, towards the traffic, towards their girlfriend, Social towards their media, ex, whatever. whatever, the more they're paying attention to it. But where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So we also know that when... It's hard to create from a place of putting attention towards negative energy. Well, you're not creating. What you're doing is you're tying up your vital life force. Mm. You're giving your power away to that person or that circumstance that you could be using to create a new life with. So when a person's sitting in their meditation, and I love doing this. We just had an event in Marco Island. I'm gonna take people further than where they normally go. I know they're gonna go, oh, well, I'm done with my meditation. No, you're not done. We're gonna take you to that point where that feeling is so in your face and you can't turn on your cell phone you can't get up and walk away because a thousand people are not getting up and walking away and you're part of the community. You're sitting in the fire and you have one of two choices. You can let that brain run on, on programs and hardwired mm -hmm. patterns and you, the arousal will drive your brain further out of balance or you'll practice the formula. And as you lower the volume to that emotion, you're gonna take your attention off that person or problem, guess what? Here comes energy back to you. You're taking your power back. And now you're building your field that way. And when that happens, energy starts to move up into the heart. Once mm -hmm. it makes it to the heart, it's going to the brain. So we start seeing people there. They, their hearts naturally open up. And all the things they thought they wanted when they came to the event, 
They no longer want because they feel like they have it. They don't need it anymore. Well, of course, they feel like they, they, they've got the feeling before the experience, so that they feel so whole that they no longer want, and and they're not looking for their future anymore. You only look for it when you feel lack. Mm. When your body is conditioned emotionally into the future, why would you look for it when it feels like it's already happened? Now this is where it gets weird, because now <laughs> things start coming to you, and you're no longer in need. And hey, when it comes to you, you go, oh here. Take it. I don't want it. I just that I just wanted to know that I could create, and people create a lot of wealth in our events. Yeah. And the first thing a lot of people do is they say, "I'm buying a cruise for you. I'm buying you your car. Oh, mom, I'm getting you that house." Why do they do that? Because they're so excited. <laughs> they feel so amazing, and they're thinking. I could do this again. Why would a, a person in lack wouldn't give? A person who's abundant would give because they know how to create. So mm. now the game changes. It's no longer about the self. Mm. And you, you're, you're doing it because that you know that you can create it. So, so then maintaining that state, when you're in love, yes. when you're in love, in love, in it, in your in, body. You are in love. Not in another relationship. No, you're not looking for it. You're, you're in it. not looking for it. You'd be in lack. When oh. you're in love, there's nothing to do. You're in love. You're 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 the magnet. You you are it. And so you that, are love. Yeah, so the events that come into your life would not only be just a reflection of a relationship with someone that you wanted to be intimate with. You would have meaningful, loving relationships mm. that would enhance that feeling. And when it didn't, you would say, "Ooh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if this is right for me." You would you would trust that because you worked really hard mm -hmm. to nurture this, to protect it, to grow it, uh, to to trust it again, to open up. Right? It takes a lot to do this. But we see men in our work. I was on them this week. I I never let up on those guys. Mm. Big macho guys. You want to be, you, you want to know what courage is? Let's go. Let's open that heart. And when they start cracking open, I mean, we see people heal from, yeah. from colon cancer and from angina and all, just boom, there it is, there it's not. That's what, that's what's been stored all down here. Once they open this up and it moves, the body is transforming in that moment. Mm. It's, the, the system is informing itself. Information is being restored back into the body. So when you get to that point where you, you, when you're in lack and separation, time gets really crazy because mm. you want stuff to happen faster and it feels like it's taking forever. That's because you're in separation. When you're in love and you're in connected, you don't want the moment to end. I mean, I had four, three guys over for dinner last night, all these academics. I cooked a meal and a half for these guys, took out great wine, why? I wanted them to be so caught up in the moment mm. that they forgot. We made a new memory. We made a, we had a great experience. And life then is about experiencing it yeah. in love. Like I'm not going to be guilty of what I'm, what I'm eating or judge what I'm eating if I've cooked a great meal. Let's eat because the guilt is worse mm. than whatever it is you think is bad for you. So then when you're feeling those elevated emotions and you're locked in love, then, then you see life through the lens of love and there's compassion. Like uh, you could look at your greatest adversary, the person that threw you under the bus mm. and you've overcome yourself and you've done the work. They've stolen from you. They've tried you to could talk bad about you behind your back. Trashing They've on you, all that stuff. You'll look at them and you'll see a part of yourself that you used to be that you no longer are and you have nothing but understanding and compassion. Wow. For like, wow, I just, I feel for that person. They're, they're hurting. They're struggling. I used to be like that, but you're no longer that. When you're that, then they push your buttons. When you're not- <laughs> You're reactive to that. Because you're equal, but you're, when you've overcome it, why would you do that? You would see them as somebody struggling, just like you see a child who's throwing a tantrum, just like, oh, they're gonna- Now here, I mean, I've got so many questions around this, but one thing quickly, how often do you find yourself in reaction mode when someone throws you under the bus, whether it's someone honking at you in a car and you say, ah, this, how often do you get back to that place? And like, cause we're, aren't we conditioned to kind of react? Dude, I react every day. So I react, oh my God, I react every day. But the fundamental question is how long are right, you gonna react? Right, right. So shortening the refractory period of your emotional reactions is that kind of intelligence where we're keeping ourselves out of the past. Mm -hmm. Justified 
valid or not, the only person that that's affecting is you. And then you have to ask yourself, is it loving to me? Well, if you can't control that emotional reaction, then you're a junkie and you're on a bad trip and you're overdosing. Mm -hmm. But if you know that you're overdosing, you got to get beyond your rational mind because you'll say, why are you this way? Oh, because I should. All right. By you doing that, is it making more of those chemicals? Yeah. Why were you doing that? To make you feel more like it's, it's justified. Mm. So then this takes Listen, I, I excuse myself many times in one day. Because you'll be, I'm in reaction mode, I'm like, let me step I'm like, aside. Are you ki- like, I'll be like, are you kidding me? What, who, what did they do? And then I'll be like, oh, we're not gonna make a decision in this, in this state. state. So give me a minute. Oh, wow. I go, take a few breaths, sh- get out of that state, remember my future, where I'm going. It's so much more important than the present moment. I just gotta condition my body into that future. And now it takes sometimes a Herculean effort, I have to tell you. You, <laughs> can, you, feel, you can ask my staff. I'll be, in my, I'll be in there 15, 20, 30 minutes. Sometimes I'll say I worked, it took me an hour. But to get, to get what, back to a peaceful state. In the expanse of all eternity, if I don't overcome that emotion, then I'm in my past, and that's karma, because that emotion's gonna drive my behaviors and thoughts, and I'm gonna be predictable. My past yeah. is gonna look, my future's gonna look a lot like my past. So if I'm soulfully on the journey, mm. then what matters the most is being able to learn the skill of mm. self-regulation. So in our, in our events, when we see people that can do brain and heart coherence, they know the formula. Well, I look at their brain scans and I'm like, Lewis, great brain. Hey, you got, you can, I, I see you can hold that heart coherence for 45 minutes. Great, now let's put you on a pole at 55 feet in the air. <laughs> let's get a heart rate monitor on you and let's see what you're gonna do up there. Mm. Do you wanna be able to self-regulate there? Because if you can there, it's not like I'm trying to give you an adrenaline rush. Actually, I'm trying to do the opposite. I want you to settle your brain and body back down, go against thousands of years of programming like fear and teach your body in that moment how to regulate. I guarantee Mm. you, if you go a little further than what you did and you stay conscious, instead of throwing in a program and rushing through it and trying to get it over with, you start breathing, you start getting back in your heart, you start getting centered, you work against those chemicals, I guarantee you when you walk into your life, you're gonna, the moment you see something you're doing, you're gonna catch on right away, you're gonna catch yourself. Now that, that saves you a lot of energy and a lot of time. Because if you're able to change it then instead of four hours later where you're just yeah. gone. Or you've already reacted. Yeah, and, 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 and you've, you've done things you said, I, you say I should have never done that, I should yeah. have never said that. That's what those emotions do because those emotions make us really primitive, really primitive. If you rewind the tape 10 years ago, you know, information was the thing that stimulated thought, stimulated new ideas. And, and as we learn new things, we make new connections in our brains. So. <clears throat> as we begin to add new stitches into that three-dimensional tapestry in our mind, we're beginning to cause our mind to function in new ways. But the key then is to apply it, to personalize it, to do something with it. And, and 10 years ago, when I went out, got in front of an audience and talked about the application, it, it, nobody wanted to step outside that philosophical, theoretical, intellectual realm, right? Because when doing something means you're going to have to change something about yourself. Painful. Yeah, you're going to get uncomfortable, yeah. right? And... Um, <clears throat> I think we're in an age of information, and in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. And because of technology, we have access to so much content, and information creates awareness. And awareness is consciousness, and you can't have consciousness without energy. They're, they work together. So there's an energetic change, I think, that's taking place in the world right now, where people are so informed that old models, old paradigms are beginning to break down, Mm -hmm. whether it's the medical model or the religious model, the educational model, journalism, uh, the the economy, you know, um, politics, it's all beginning to uh, come to the surface because something else has to come out. And and I think that one of the things that uh, people are realizing is that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk to do this or a a nun with 40 years of devotion. You just gotta understand the formula. And just like any skill or anything you learn, you gotta go from thinking to doing to being. You gotta take knowledge, you you create the experience, and if you keep doing it over and over again, you start getting a skill or you start getting wise about how to do it. And you you know that you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, in the last 10 years, we have assembled a scientific team and let's see if you can really make significant brain changes. I, I don't want 
those changes to just be in your mind. I want them to be in your brain. I want to be able to see before and after pictures to mm -hmm. say that person has a significant change after a traumatic brain injury or anxiety or depression or a cyclic mood disorder or a stroke. We want to see that there's been significant change. At the same time, let's measure your brain in real time and let's look to see what that transformation process looks like. Mm. And in the discovery, Lewis, of that process, we gained so much knowledge about what that transformational process looks like. Right. In other words, I can tell you without a doubt that if you're analyzing your life right now within some disturbing emotion, that 100% of the time you're going to make your brain worse. If you Be think about your life, if you're stuck in an emotion, like oh, you're frustrated, yeah, yeah. you're angry, you're fearful, resentful, resentful, and you're thinking within that emotional state. In other words, mm -hmm. you can't think greater than how you feel. That means then you were thinking in the past because those emotions are a record or residue of the past. So we see people in the, in the process of change that are analyzing in, uh, in, in duality or polarity. That kind of drives the brain into higher states of arousal mm. and, and further away from true change. Mm. So we did, uh, we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of brain scans and, and we now know that there's a formula to create greater brain coherence, greater brain efficiency, to make your brain work better. And when mm. your brain works better, you work better. At the same time, it requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion to begin to change your energy and to change your life. And nobody changes until they change their energy, right? right? So then how do you get a person out of resentment and frustration into joy and freedom if why would they feel grateful or joyful or free if the experience hasn't happened? So most mm -hmm. people are spending the majority of their life waiting for something out there to take away their emptiness or pain or the resentment in here. Well. If they're, they're waiting their whole life in separation or lack, then and, and we create reality, then the lack is driving certain thoughts, which is creating more separation and more lack. So teaching people then to begin to condition their body emotionally before the evidence takes place in their life is breaking a significant habit, right? Yes. So instead of living by cause and effect, now we're beginning to cause and effect. So the moment you start feeling whole and grateful, we now know your healing will begin at that moment. Yes. The moment you start feeling um, worthy and abundant, your wealth is coming. You know, you're generating a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of wealth, and so. How does someone feel worthy though if they've always been told they're not worth it? Yeah. Well, so let or, me. Or that's the story they tell yeah, themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm not worth it because yeah. she didn't say yes when I asked her on a date. Right. Because he broke up with me, because I got yeah. fired, because my parents left me. How do they? How am I worth it when yeah. there's so much evidence or story right. around a negative well, thing? Well, let's stop telling the story of your past and let's start telling the story of your future. And and people who aren't defined by a vision of the future, for the most part, are left with memories of the past. The, uh -huh. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced at this moment. So most people wake up in the morning, and they start thinking about their problems. Yeah. And those problems are memories that are tattooed in the brain that are associated to certain people and things at certain times and places. So the, moment the person wakes up clean slate, they start thinking about the problems they're thinking in the past. If you believe your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, well, there's a possibility that your past is going to be your future. Mm. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So then the moment you start recalling the problem, you start feeling unhappy, now your body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you mm. think and how you feel creates a state of being. So people reaffirm their identity based on the past, right? And it turns out that wow. the redundancy of doing that, conditioning only requires, requires an image and an emotion. And most people are unconsciously conditioning their body into the familiar past, into the known. So now if you're in the familiar past and in the known, you're going to crave the predictable future, right. right? That's the known as well. And there's only one place where the unknown exists, and that's the eternal present moment. That's mm. the sweet spot of the generous present moment. So you got you got to labor to get that person beyond the emotions that keep them tacked or anchored to the past. And yes, it takes an effort to do that. But if you keep working with the formula, you'll reach that elegant moment where there's a liberation of energy. Mm. And now your body, as the unconscious mind, 
the objective mind is not believing, it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day because you're liberating the body from that emotional state. So you ask a person, why are you so unhappy? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you so resentful? The moment you ask that, their brain is going to associate that emotion to a past event. To a memory. To experience. a memory. Yeah. That's because they have nothing to look forward to in their future. So if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, it just means to me that you're more in love with your past mm. than you are with the future. So how do you teach people to believe in a future that they can't see or experience with their senses yet, but they've thought about enough times in their mind that their brain has literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says that's absolutely possible. Mm. We know that. And how do you teach a person to select a new possibility in their future and begin to emotionally embrace that future before it's made manifest to such a degree that their body is their unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present moment and they're signaling new genes and new ways ahead of the environment now to their body begins to change to look like the event has already occurred we've proven that that's possible now think about this so the more you think about your desired future the joy the gratitude the uh the feelings you want to have that are more positive, the more you think about it as, it's, as a future thing happening, the more your body shifts now. Exactly. So your body is believing it's living in that future reality now. in the present moment. Now think about this. From some condition in your life, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you narrow your focus on the cause and the brain freezes an image and takes a snapshot. And that memory now is embossed in the brain. It's branded in there. So then people think neurologically within the circuits of those past experiences and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And the stronger the betrayal, the stronger the trauma, the more the body's living in the past, right? right so yeah. then, so how do you reverse that? So now, if you truly got passionate about a future, we've all done this. You get a wild idea in your mind and uh -huh. you start holding on to that vision and you're preoccupied with it all of a sudden the thought in your mind becomes the experience and you start feeling the, the energy of the future. Yeah. Now, the stronger the emotion you feel from that vision, the more you're going to pay attention to the picture in your mind and now you're remembering your future. And vice and, versa, the stronger you pay attention to the feeling of the past pain, you're going to create the pain in this moment. Exactly. So then, so it requires a coherent brain mm -hmm. and we now know that there's a formula for that and we've got beautiful research to show that people can do it. They just have to practice. And it requires a coherent heart because resentment, frustration, impatience creates a very incoherent <laughs> heart. Yeah. And when that heart becomes incoherent, you stop trusting yourself. There's no energy there. You, get, you stop trusting in your future. Wow. So then if there's physical evidence in your brain and body, physical evidence to look like the event has already occurred, it's quite possible you'll be thinking neurologically within the circuits of your future and you'll begin to feel chemically within the boundaries of that emotion of your future. Mm -hmm. And how you think and how you feel is your state of being. And now your state of being is living in the future instead of the past. Now, the moment you disconnect from the emotion of your future, because of traffic or some coworker or your ex or whatever people come up with, now you're back to the energy of your past. Oh. And now you're gonna start looking for it, analyzing why hasn't it happened? Well. If you're feeling the emotion of your future, why would you look for it? Because you would feel like it already happened and that mm. is the place where the magic happens. So then you can't just do this, get up and then return back to your old state of being. You gotta maintain that modified state How of do you mind. Maintain and mind. It? That's, when when that's life practice. happens. Well, let me finish. If I punch it, you in the face right now, how do you maintain? <laughs> well, of course, of course. I mean, we all take blows in our lives yeah. and, and we all react emotionally. But the question is, how long are you going to react? Right, right. Okay. So then if you can't mediate and regulate your emotional mm -hmm. reactions and those emotions linger for days, that's a years mood. Years for some people. Mood and then months, temperament, years, personality trait. So then the person's personality is literally based on the past. But Crazy. they don't know that because they're doing it over and over again. It becomes a subconscious program. So now if it requires a coherent brain and a coherent heart, then we have to train people uh -huh. how to self-regulate. So we've done thousands and thousands of measurements. We've partnered with the HeartMath Institute to teach people how to create and sustain heart coherence. How do we do it? Well, 
besides going to your workshop? What's a simplified version? I'm sure it takes more time than... Well, it really doesn't. Oh. It really doesn't. It just requires getting still, closing your eyes, putting your attention on your heart, changing your breath so that you move into the present moment. And when you slow your breathing down, you slow your brain waves down. When you slow your brain waves down, now you're accessing your autonomic nervous system. So then you train a person how to open their heart and feel an elevated emotion. And it takes a little practice. And just like a flower that, that takes time to bloom, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. takes a little bit of time. But if mm -hmm. you work in trading the resentment, the frustration or the impatience for gratitude, appreciation and thankfulness, and you keep at it, there'll come a moment where that system switches on and now you're feeling grateful for no reason at all. Right. That's, that's not a bad <laughs> thing because gratitude, the emotional signature of gratitude means something's happening to you, something has happened to you, yeah. you're receiving something or you just received something. So your body then, when you're feeling gratitude, is in the perfect state of receiving. Mm -hmm. So then that means then you'll accept, believe, and surrender to the thoughts equal to the emotional state of gratitude. Mm -hmm. If you're living in resentment, you're living in fear, you're living in, in, in patience, you could say, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm with all you want, and that thought's gonna stop right at the brainstem and never make its way to the body because the because body's- your not feeling or because why? Because you're feeling resentment. Uh -huh. And that thought isn't, the, that thought is not consistent with the emotion of resentment. resentment has a different set of thoughts, right? In other words, once you start opening your heart, it begins to move into coherence. It begins to produce a measurable magnetic field up to three meters wide. Now that's frequency, that's energy. And all that energy, that frequency carries information, carries an intent. So then when you're feeling gratitude and your heart is open, you're broadcasting energy into the mm -hmm. field. A now, frequency. A yeah. frequency. You lay the intent of the thought of your health or your wealth. That frequency can carry the thought of your wealth. It can mm. carry the thought of your health. If you're suffering, you can't, the suffering does not carry, that energy does not carry the thought of your wealth. It carries a different set of thoughts. So then, so then we're teaching people how to self-regulate because if you're going to believe in that future that you're imagining with all of your heart, it better be open and activated right, right. and you better know how to self-regulate and you have to know the moment you disconnect from the energy of your future because of some circumstance in your life and you lose that feeling, if you're practicing it on a daily basis with your eyes closed, then the next level is to be able to open your eyes and do it right in the moment mm. and be able to self-regulate and change the, the frustration from some experience in your life back to the energy of your future. Now, that requires great awareness and great effort, but if you have a community of people that are practicing this on a daily basis and they're connected to their future because that's where their, their mind is, mm -hmm. um, they begin to want the future more than the emotions the of the past. So we've done enough measurements now, Lewis, to know that we can teach people how to do that and we have evidence that people can sustain it for 45 minutes to an hour. It's a skill now. They know yeah. that they know how to do it. So now they have brain coherence and heart coherence. Well, once the heart begins to become orderly and coherent, it acts as an amplifier and it drives mm. energy to the brain. So now the brain is getting more energy once the heart is open and then you're thinking a different set of thoughts and those thoughts produce different chemicals for you to feel more of that and here comes uh, nitric oxide from oxytocin mm. and all of a sudden your heart literally starts to swell. It literally begins to open up and there's more energy going there and now you're coming from a different level of mind. What is the most important thing in your life? And, and that could be your family, that could be your hobbies, that could be uh, certain causes. And, mm. and if that's more important than money, you should go for it. And uh, I can teach many ways to invite money in after uh, you find what you do.